You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, folks. Kara is off this week. Uh, she's busy with work, so it's just the boys. <laughs> the boys. <laughs> the the four of us. So you guys have heard NASA has announced its definitive plans for the International Space Station. We've been following this for a while. They they've been saying yeah, you know, basically, you know, till the end of the decade. But now they NASA is saying the ISS will operate through the end of 2030. Okay. And sometime in 2031, they are going to crash it into the ocean. They're going to bring the whole thing down. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Well, what is that going to look like? I mean, how much of yeah. it will survive past the atmosphere, I wonder? Not not much. If, if they knew what they were doing, they would like try somehow to film the whole thing. Well, why couldn't you they? Why I mean? couldn't they film it from space and from, from the ground? Uh, yeah, they should. They should wait for a clear day. You know, <laughs> they should attach cameras to the ISS filming itself and streaming it. Of course. I imagine they will. I mean, I'm how often do you didn't. get to crash a giant space station into the ocean? Well, every every and 50 years, no, I think. There's no plans for a replacement, right? I guess they're trying to get private industry to do it. You know, there's not much information. The, yeah, NASA is going to – they want to seed low Earth orbit to private industry. So just like with, you know, getting – rockets into low earth orbit they're going to also just let private industry do um, low earth orbit stations as well so they're yeah they're pretty much done they're going to have their eyes set on the moon and mars which is a good idea there's already companies planning on putting you know stations up there yeah china has their space station in the works yeah you know they, they man china spends a lot of money on that stuff man they're they're really pushing hard to get into space so they're they're going to crash it on they're planning on aiming it at a point in the Pacific Ocean known as Point Nemo, which is the farthest point from land anywhere in this Pacific, which is, I guess, a good idea. Minimize the probability sense. that you're going hit, to hit, hit land somewhere. Yeah. I wonder how much there plus minus is for hitting the yeah, actual right? point. 100, kil, 100 kilometers plus or minus. Uh, but even so, yeah, I think Point Nemo is several thousand kilometers far away from mm-hmm. any land. Yeah. So... I imagine did, did the, it's pretty safe. Did the fish get any vote? Probably not. <laughs> Nemo Probably the not. fish. What about other countries? Did they get any say? I mean, they put a lot of money and resources into this too. Well, I'm sure they all had to agree, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of con- countries have been wanting to back out or have like defunded it. You know, it's already... Yeah, Russia has pulled back sort of their participation and the upkeep costs and other things having to do with the ISS. We reported on this a couple of years back mm-hmm. that, that uh, Russia is also moving in a direction in which they're going to have their own station up there. And they pulled resources away from I- from ISS in order to start those programs. It is sad. It is too bad that there isn't a an economical and safe way to like push it into a higher orbit where it's out of yeah, the way of everything. Yeah, let's for a while. Yeah. Museum it, orbit, just right. have it, Yeah, museum orbit, exactly. But it's, So why is that? Period. Because it still requires fuel, right? Oh, yeah. It'd be really it's expensive still, to do that. Yeah, it's not, it's not a zero-sum game there. Yeah, I know. They don't want pieces breaking off and stuff. So I guess it's, it is better just to keep, keep orbit decluttered as much as possible. But Yeah, and if that thing get hit, you know, if that thing got hit, um, you know, that could be, That'd be quite a, a bit lot of debris, of debris yeah. potentially. Yeah, there's already massive debris problems in space. We don't need to feed the feed the problem any further. Got to take as much stuff out of out of space as we can. You know, sure they they they'll do something fun like like digitize the the entire thing so, so that you could you could yeah. literally like in VR go through pretty much exactly the way it is now, just go through the entire space station, even work some of the, some of the computers and machinery mm-hmm. uh, in, v, in VR. It's like you're, like you're pretty much right there. That would be that's a, true. A worthwhile. Look out the window. There's the earth. Hello. Yeah, that's, cool. a very, that's a cool idea, Bob. We should be, with our technology that we have today, I mean, we could do this type of thing. We could take, you know, 360 degree footage and then a computer can extrapolate from that and actually, you know, make it a 3D space. Sure. We should take historical footage of things like this and preserve them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, like super high res, you know, 8, 10K, you know, whatever, however many K you need. Yeah, I mean, that's happening now. I mean, but yeah, they, definitely they should do a high res scan of the of the space station. 
Uh, what's funny is we mentioned you know the lifespan of the ISS in our our forthcoming book, and we we just had the final edits accepted. Yay! So we uh, we're done. Like no more changes to the copy of the book. But I managed to to squeeze in some updates, including this one, because the the figures that I had in there from like a year ago were just slightly outdated. So I was able mm-hmm. to get get the updates in there. Uh, it's uh, going to hurt so bad, Steve, when we have a significant thing that dates the book, right? That makes it so the book is no longer 100% accurate, but there's nothing we could do about it. That well, always it's, happens. It's constant, that though. It, it's constant. I mean, even though, like, in the last, you know, nine months since our first draft, there's been constant news items coming out that would require tweaks to the text in the book. And then there was, you know, Bob, you just sent sent us one today where it's like, it's not a big deal. It's just a little 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 tweak. But we talked about the price of getting stuff into orbit and you know elon musk t- tweeted a graph i guess that spacex put together to logarithmic scale of the cost of getting a kilogram of stuff into orbit showing how much it's dropped you know since the apollo days to the uh, the falcon heavy which i think is now the most the cheapest way to get stuff into space mm. but then also projecting the projected cost for the starship which yeah. was least, you know, they're claiming it's going to be less than $200 a kilogram. That's a massive drop, you know, considering it was around $100,000 40, 50 years ago. The average of the space shuttle was something in the um, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000 by the, by the end uh, per kilogram. Now we're down in the two, $3,000 per, per kilogram range. So a huge drop, you know. Yeah. Well, it's still I mean, expensive. It, it's of course, it's going to go down. Well, I don't know. I don't think it's. What do you mean by "of course"? Like it's inevitable. It, I mean by yeah, that because much, I don't think so. I mean well, the as, reason it was pretty plateaued until you know the reusable rocket t- technology was developed. Like that technology had to be developed in order to continue to bring down prices significantly. You know. Well, that's what I'm saying though. Like once once the reusable components, you know, once that had been put into you know, production, you know, we also have a company that is 3D printing space capsules, you know, that that technology. And of course, you know, the the corporate push to get into outer space and everything, of course, that's going to dramatically lower the price. Mm -hmm. But there are some there are certain fixed costs, you know, like the fuel, you know, for example, and there are certain certain components that are not going to be reusable. Yep. So yeah, I do, we, you know, that's one, you know, one of the th- questions that we address in the book, like how low will it come? Will it go? Like how far theoretically can we, can we bring it down? And what will that mean in terms of access to space and all the repercussions of that? You know, sub 200 is huge. That's like a, that's really cheap. That once you get down to that level, then uh, a lot of things become more, more feasible, you know? Yeah. yeah, it might it might prevent the development of other potential technologies, you know, to to get into space, mm-hmm. uh, like you know the space elevator, which we also talk about in the book. Yeah, yeah, um, which but, is not uh, going to happen, it's, basically. Yeah, it's just uh-huh. it's probably <laughs> not on. Yeah, probably not on Earth. But Moon and Mars, different story. Mm-hmm. Mars, I think, is the for, best bet for a space elevator. Just has the right gravity, et cetera. But yeah, you know, I don't think it's going to happen on Earth. But and also remember, like the spin thing we talked about, like where you spin yeah. it up and fling. Oh, I don't think yeah. that's going to happen either. Fling, fling. spin and spin and. Fling. Oh, really, Steve? You you think that the inertial thing is not going to happen? No, I just straight up don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to again when you can get when you can just rocket things into orbit at less than two hundred dollars a kilogram. There's going to be no incentive for stuff like that, and that's going to be expensive and risky. And it's I don't see that. I don't see it competing with rockets. It's like one of the interesting things that we talk about is like the surprising persistence of technology. Using chemical rockets to blast off the surface of the Earth is going to be, you know, basically the best option we have for the foreseeable future. Like there isn't really even yeah. any advanced technology that gets you away from that. All of the advanced propulsion we talk about doesn't have the thrusts to get you off of a 1G planet. Mm. It's you really need the thrust. Only chemical rockets have the thrust. Yeah, there, there is one. Right? It, there's, there's nothing one even on the yeah. drawing board that will that will. Well, there was one. If I remember, rockets. if I remember from my research, there was one iteration of, of nuclear rockets that could potentially do it. But I, I think that the jury's probably out on that. And yeah, Stephen, look, just looking at this chart, I mean, if we get if if they predict you know sub two hundred dollars per kilogram within the next couple of years for Starship, I mean. 
I would have to think that over the next 20, 30, 30 years, they, they could get it sub 100 possibly when they really yeah. make it efficient. Sub $100 per kilogram. I mean, that alone would, would why waste so much money on any, on any other way when that is that cheap? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'd have to come up with a dramatic new technology to make it worthwhile developing and pumping money in. Um, oh my you know, gosh. I mean, if it's the R and D cost for that thing alone would make it, it doesn't sound like there's really going to be any other way to go. I mean, yeah, you have to invent I, the new technology and spend what many hundreds of billions of dollars probably getting to that point. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, Not perhaps, yeah, and perhaps using things like accelerating small satellites into orbit from the from the surface. Um, you yeah, know, I think small thousands satellites. of G's, thousands of G's that no human could survive. But, but no but, payload, no people, nothing like that. Right, nothing like a people or or delicate satellites or heavy satellites. The lighter stuff, I could see that as you know, as, yeah. as, as like an adjunct to to chemical to chemical rockets. On that show. Um, for all mankind, which is a great like alternate universe look at where the space program could be if we kept it up. But towards yeah, their their advanced uh, rockets were fission, right? They were nuclear, and they, so they got would, into that, huh? Yeah, yeah. So they had they had fission based rockets, which again that by itself not really good for for getting off the Earth because they don't have the thrust. No. But how they got around that is they took off with the with the fission rocket attached to like a seven forty seven. Got that got up into you know as high as that can go, and then it, the fission ship blasted off from there. So I don't know if oh, okay. that's a way to do it. Like if you could do a two stage thing like that, I don't know if anyone's crunched the numbers to know that that would work. But the, but yeah, fission rockets are great in terms of specific impulse, their efficiency, but they just don't have the thrust. So I know I just think that it's yeah. going to be chemical rockets forever. You know until like really yeah. exotic technology comes into play which is fine yeah it's just just weird to think about that like we already are using pretty much the and then and the other thing is like the most the best fuel is hydrogen like we're already using probably the best fuel (laughs) for chemical rockets that we will ever have yeah right just by just physics right it's just it's the lightest physics and the rocket equation you know hydrogen is like the best stuff steve remember when we discovered that um if if the earth was only a little bit you know 10.5 g 1.5 then chemical rockets would not be an option for us you couldn't get into orbit like we don't have the two you could not get into orbit on a 1.5 g planet like a chemical rocket the rocket equation would basically doom it like it would slap you in the face yeah, it's like wow. So what if what do civilizations that evolve on a one point five or greater surface gravity? Yeah, that's planet, it. They're isolated. They yeah, are like stuck, heavy, you're heavy stuck G, where you, live. you know, heavy heavy G planets are are you know if you live if you evolved on there you're in, you're in deep trouble. And I wonder if you could like go to the top of a mountain, Steve. You know, yeah, the mountain. Yeah, I mean, it's got a hundred feet tall in the mountain in that place. Yeah, yeah. You wonder if there's good. What's the workaround um, in terms of? Like to, to, once you get fusion rockets, can you develop a fusion rocket? And then again, you fly to the upper atmosphere. I mean, there might be some way to extend it a little bit. But again, think about it. It means that like we're not going to be to be settling worlds with with surface gravities over one point five g. It's just not practical. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And plus, why yeah. would we even bother? Going to a world that one point five, you can you can get around one point five. You can live there, but you just you, you, once you once you land on the surface, though you're there. That's you're not it. spacefaring. That's yeah, that's yeah. it. Be a good place to work out. Yeah, Jim. but I mean, Christ, I'm tired enough <laughs> as it is. You know, like do we really have to increase <laughs> gravity? <laughs> like, Two hundred yeah, pounds yeah. becomes three hundred pounds, just like. Well, just get your get your in your, you in your genetically engineered body. All right, well, right. I would. I'm down with that. I just you know. I just or your android it. body. I already got a lot on my shoulders, Steve. So let's not. Yeah. No, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, we have an exciting show coming up for you. So we're going to start with Bob. Your news item is about the dark side of hot Jupiters. Yeah. uh, Hot Jupiters turned into a hot topic this week uh, with a a closer look 
at their dark side than ever before. Oh, I didn't so this, realize they were all evil. I know, right? Well, I secretive, right? <laughs> so this was published in Nature Astronomy recently by researchers that consisting of collaborators from MIT, Johns Hopkins University, Caltech, the big hitters there. We've talked about hot Jupiters a few times on the show. Basically, gas giants like Jupiter or, or even far bigger uh, that are found near their parent star, very near, typically with orbital periods less than 10 days. That's crazy. Imagine celebrating a birthday every 10 days. I'd go crazy. Right. Happy 452nd birth. And then, uh, of course, you know, how do they get so close to the sun? That's still a bit of a mystery. You know, perhaps they migrate in, perhaps they develop in C2. Nah, they got to migrate in. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's a consensus, probably. Uh, so this one is about WASP-121b. This is a hot Jupiter discovered six years ago, 850 light years from Earth. That's not too far. No, it has one of the shortest orbits ever detected, 30 hours. <laughs> so if Steve, if Steve was born on that, he would be 16,801 <laughs> years old. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Steve. Steve. <laughs> so if oh, you, and tomorrow, happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you guessed that it's tidally locked, you are correct. One side permanently faces its sun. The other side never sees it. This no. And this actually makes the atmosphere kind of shaped like a football, apparently. Oh, it bulges the... Uh... The tidal, the tidal forces. And, uh, and t- speaking of tidal forces, tidal locking is a fascinating process. Look it up. Uh, that's essentially the tidal interaction between two orbiting bodies. And this creates a tidal breaking where one or both bodies eventually stop rotating relative to each other. Mm. Uh, now, our moon has already done that. It's tidally locked. And in, in a few months, oh, wait, sorry, in 50 billion years, Earth will be tidally locked to the moon as well. But of um, course, that will never happen since yeah. the sun will likely vaporize us way before then. But it's this fascinating process. Um, I I remember reading a quote. If you really want to see dramatic stuff happening, don't look at gravity. Look at tidal forces because that kind of stuff can just rip planets apart. So we've been studying uh, hot Jupiters like this for years. But the nature of those studies have recently changed. Thomas McCall Evans, who led the study as a postdoc at MIT, said, we are now moving beyond taking isolated snapshots of specific regions of exoplanet atmospheres to study them as the 3D systems they truly are. So this is kind of what's new here. So this is what the uh, Hubble Space Telescope is allowing us to do now using its onboard uh, spectroscopic camera. So using uh, the various intensities of the various wavelengths of light that are d- displayed using this camera, we can. it gives us clues to the temperature and even the composition of the atmosphere 850 light years away. Truly amazing. Now, that's kind of easy to do on the bright side, and we've been doing that uh, for a while. But the breakthrough here, the real breakthrough here is being able to do that on the dark side of the gas giant, the side that's always facing outwards, never seeing its parent star. Because you have to look – it's really hard because you have to look for these super tiny changes in the in the gestalt, if you will, of the entire spectrum of the planet and not just the specific wavelengths. But – if you want to track the water in the atmosphere, though, you need to look at a specific line or what they call a spectral feature, which tracks what the water is doing. So now regarding that specifically, uh, McCall Evans said, we saw this water feature and mapped how it changed at different parts of the planet's orbit. That encodes information about what the temperature of the planet's atmosphere is doing as a function of altitude. So, so using this changing water spectral feature, Um, The researchers could determine a lot of details about what's happening, not only on the lit side and the dark side of the planet, but also at lots of different altitudes on both sides of the planet. So they looked at, they determined that on the day side, the temperature ranges from 2200 C or 4000 degrees Fahrenheit at its deepest layer. And then if you go up to the topmost layers of the atmosphere on the day side, it's 3200 C. Uh, Celsius and 5,800 Fahrenheit. So that so that's a rise in temperature with altitudes. That's like a, that's a thermal inversion. The night side is the opposite. It, it drops with the temperature drops with altitude. So at the highest altitudes, it's 1,200 Celsius, 2,200 Fahrenheit, and at its deepest layers on the night side, it's 1,500 Celsius, 2,800 Fahrenheit. Pretty damn hot. Pretty damn hot place. So what they were able to do was to track for the first time the water cycle on WASP-121b. Ne- you know, something like that's never been done before. Now, we know the water cycle here on Earth, right? What, what are the hallmarks of the water cycle on Earth? Right. Evaporation, right? Yeah. Oh, Condens- yeah. Condensation and precipitation. And precipitation. precipitation. Those, those three. And of course, if you, depending on what website you, can go, you go to, you could see four, four or even seven, seven major elements 
to the water cycle on Earth. But those are the big boys here. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. What about urination? Rinse uh, and no, repeat. That's only loosely connected. So water evaporates, it condenses into clouds, and it rains, blah, blah, blah. So the, the cycle, the water cycle on WASP-121b is, I would say, a lot less gentle. In, in, the, intense, in the intense day side of the planet, it's so hot that water molecules are essentially blasted apart. Right, because temperatures are like near 2,700 Celsius. Blast apart the water molecules. Now these components then are, are blown back, blown to the dark side of the planet, where the lower temperature allows them to recombine into water again. So it goes back into water. Oh, interesting. Right, which is then blown. The the winds blow it to the to the light side of the planet again, and the process starts all over. Like it's playing apart. pong with itself. So, in a way. but a very fast pong because the winds, the sustained winds that are part of this process, are thought to be up to. Five kilometers per second. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's 11,000 miles an hour winds. Now, you know how hurricanes are classified as category one, two, three? This would be a category 547 oh my God. If, you, if you nonsensically just keep adding the numbers as it's done in one through five. That'll take That's category out. 547, which, of course, is silly, but it gives you an mm. idea. They, researchers calculate that these 11,000 mile an hour winds can move clouds across the entire planet in 20 hours. And this is a big planet. This is like, what, 10 times the mass of Jupiter. 10 big times. Boy. Then they found out something else that might, that, that might be blown around the planet. And this is even cooler. They, they put these, so they look, they have these temperature profiles, right? They know right. what the temperature is at various altitudes on the light and the dark side of the planet. So they know that. They put those temperatures into the mo- into models to see what chemicals could exist in these environments. And get this, there could be what they're calling metal clouds on the dark side of the planet. Oh, wow. Iron, clouds? iron, titanium, and the mineral corundum, which makes up sapphires and rubies. It's a mineral that, that makes up sapphires so and rubies. So does it rubies. rain rubies then? Yes, kind of does, uh, but more liquidy. These metallized clouds then would be vaporized on the light side of the planet, and then they would reform on the colder dark side, and maybe, and maybe on a, on its way back to the light side, it rains liquid gems before being obliterated again in, on the light side. So yeah, it's a pretty pretty wicked planet. Um, so in the, I'm really looking forward to the future because the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, which is going to be looking at this later this year, cool. and they hope to they hope to do stuff like track carbon monoxide as well on the planet, which hasn't been done before. And I'm sure that there's going to be plenty more surprises for us on WASP 121b, the super hot Jupiter. So can't wait. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I yeah. know that there's you know, some of the exoplanets that we're discovering have really extreme conditions. I think the hot Jupiters are among the most extreme yeah. right? for the reason that you state because they're so close to the Yeah, I'm not sh- Yeah, be curious to see if the, if you know what kind of life could even evolve in a, in a place like that. Yeah, um, nothing. Cuz vaporized you typically water. Think, uh, yeah, yeah, it just did with those with those, you know, the, with those winds 11,000 miles per hour, 5 kilometers a second. Uh crazy stuff, but I can't wait till James Webb takes a look at that bad boy. All right, thanks Bob. Jay, you're going to tell us about the psychology of jumping to conclusions. Do people do that? They do, Steve. Lots of people do it. Um, let me ask you guys a question to start this Five. Thing off, though. Right. Oops, exactly. Sorry. Thank you. End of show. Guys, <laughs> how much energy would you say you spend making a big decision? A big decision. Like getting married. <laughs> I mean, That's it could be months. Like, I've researched big purchases for months. Oh, cameras, right, Steve? I, I've, I've researched little little purchases for months. <laughs> Evan, how about you? Sure. I've Yes, I've, I've spent months researching certain things, like uh, the, the solar panels and things that were recently installed in my house. I did spend a few months uh, doing all my research on that. Evan, would you mind just giving me the answer to all your research so I don't have to do it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'll send you my notes. No That'd problem. That'd be awesome. You yeah, so you know, ask yourself this question. It's it's something to just give yourself a quick, you know, analysis of, you know, do you put the time in with decisions, you know, or are you or are you a quick decision maker? Well, this is gonna be an eye opener because there's there's some information here that some recent research has uncovered that is not gonna be super surprising, but the details are are intriguing. So of course, like we just you know, identified ourselves as overthinkers, if anything. There are people who do a good amount of research. Uh, when, when trying to figure out like what their next move is, could be on any decision. However, researchers 
have shown recently that a significant percentage of people barely put any time into making big decisions. And they wanted to understand how this happened, why this happened, you know, get some get some framing around it to so so it can be researched further. People tend to spend more time considering things that please them than things that that need real attention. Like as an example, the how much time do you really put into your taxes versus how much time um, would you spend planning a vacation? Right. I mean, yeah. it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. You're going to get by with as little. One's work fun, as the other is day. torture. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and in fact, one in five people spend more time planning a vacation, say, than something along those lines, like something that might, might be moderately painful to deal with. This kind of thinking is related to a term we all know well. Quick decision making can actually be a cognitive bias, which is an f- interesting way to frame you know, quick decision making. I never thought that there was a direct connection between that, but let me explain. Having a cognitive bias means that a person is influenced by their own subjective reality. So what does that mean? Let's say that somebody, someone's worldview is that secretive, powerful people control everything that happens in the world, the Illuminati, right? Or someone's cognitive bias is that all foreigners are dangerous. This kind of thinking distorts that person's perception of reality and it distorts their behavior and the decisions that they make. Yeah, that's a com- that's a confirmation bias. Exactly. You know, that's just exactly. Yeah, you which we wrote about in our first book, you know, that the idea that your brain is really good at first of all perceiving a lot of information and picking out those bits that seem to support something you want to believe or already believe and you know, you explain away and dismiss things that seem to uh, contradict what you want to believe. And then that could create the powerful illusion that there's a lot of evidence to support your position, but it's really just all your own by internal bias. And as a, a well-seasoned, practiced skeptic, I do this every day. I do it. We all do it. You know, like you, you, you can't completely get rid of that, even if you made it your life's goal. It, it is a part of the way our brains work. Making quick, uninformed decisions is a form of also, Steve, jumping to conclusions, right? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, jumping to a conclusion specifically means what? That you're making a decision or forming an opinion with little or no information to back it up. So an individual has a tendency to make the mental mistake of not considering the available information that's out there. And this is kind, this kind of thinking is a form of cognitive distortion. So the researchers studied 600 people from the general population looking at their decision-making patterns. They used a game as the basis of the experiment. The game's premise is that someone is fishing from two lakes. Now, guys, I want you to do this with me, okay? So here's right. the premise. Someone is fishing from two lakes. You're watching this okay. person fish from you know lake one and lake two. The okay. first lake has mostly red fish, and the second lake has mostly gray fish. The research subjects could stop the fisher at any time when they think that they can determine what lake you know, she was fishing out of. Okay? Do you follow me? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the fisher is Based only Based on fi- what they're catching? Yes. The fisher is only fishing out of one lake, and you don't know which lake. You just know that one of the lakes has mostly red fish, and one of the lakes has mostly gray fish. All right. So before I go on right here, guys, and everyone listening to this, in your head, think about how many caught fish you would want the fisher to have before you make a decision on what lake they're fishing out of. Okay. Yeah, it partly oh, okay. depends on what you mean by mostly. Mostly Could 60%? Be 51%. Or 99%. It, that's the yeah. only information you're given. Right, to, to, to help you guys, I personally would want 10 caught fish. Then I think, okay, let me look at the fish, and I'll come up with what's the percentage inside those 10 fish, and I would make my decision from there, whether it's the red lake or the gray lake. It depends on what the results are. You know, I have, that, that's a dynamic decision. I can't tell you ahead of time what the number is. If they are pulling out, the fisher pulls out six redfish in a row, you know, that's pretty good evidence that they're fishing out of the red lake. But you're not seeing data as it's coming in, Steve. You're just saying, okay, stop. You've collected enough fish. Now let me see what you have and I'll oh, tell you what That's lake. different. Yeah, that's different. If you don't, yeah. if you're not able to make that decision dynamically after looking at the evidence, you have to decide ahead of time without knowing the percentage, just mostly one or the other color. Let's say the maybe stakes- Maybe 20, maybe 20. Yeah, it's stakes, hard to say. The stakes are I, low, Steve. The stakes are low. No, nobody's going to die from your thing. That How many, was what, my what next number? question. What are the stakes? If the stakes are high, I would want- a hundred fish. You know, I'd want a lot of fish. If the stakes are low, yeah, tw- twenty is probably reasonable. How about you, Ev? Yeah, I think twenty is a good number. I, I, 
completely expected this kind of response from you guys, which I love. I love the fact that you guys were really thinking about it. You had to, you had to like turn it over in your head. Of course, Steve did it the most, right? You know, there's a lot of variables that go into it. What do you mean? I just, I just did it internally. But, but the idea here is that <laughs> because we're skeptics and we, we, we're critical thinkers and we've trained ourselves to turn information over in our head, to want information, right? First, you feel the vacuum of information and then, then you're like, okay, here's the information I'd like to have. Well, if I don't have it, then I got to use what it, tiny information I have. And then you come out with a complicated kind of answer to this, right? This, this is what I expect a lot, of, a lot of critical thinkers would do. The research subjects who jumped to conclusions, guess how many they required, guys? Uh, Three. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll say four. One five to ten, two five fish. To ten. One, one, two, two. 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 That's yeah. just Come stupid. On. Bob, it is what it is. This is how many fish they thought that they needed to see, or that was enough information for them to make a decision on what lake the were, fisherman what? was. Were they five? Were they five year olds? Do they no, have zero no. concept of statistics? But, Evan, that's a great question. I mean, I honestly can't answer that question. You would think yes, but at the same time, I don't think again that they're really thinking. They're just going by their gut. They're just what well, I think. You know, a couple of fish is good. I can make a decision. They're, you know, they're jumping to a conclusion. They're not thinking about all the things that we all. Wow! Just if there's no, pr- degree. it's not yeah. like name that tune. We have to name it in the fewest notes. You you would want to gather more evidence than not gather more evidence. Exactly, but you came to a conclusion. That's part of the, this whole thing, which I'll get into a little bit more detail. But you think it's really just the convenience of making a quick decision that could be compelling a lot of people as well. They're not thinking about any of this. So follow me here. The researchers interviewed the test subjects and found that the fewer fish a person required to make a decision tracked with how many other errors in thinking and reasoning they had. I bet you can guess where this is going, right? The lower the number of fish showed that the person was more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. The same people were more likely to believe in medical myths and the paranormal. It tracks, guys. Isn't that that incredible? Lower Uh, fish... I would predict that. Lower fish test subjects also made a higher number of errors on problems that needed more, you know, more contemplative inquiry. So let's have fun with a test question they asked the the test subjects. I'm going to give you something else. Rounding to the nearest five cents, a baseball bat and ball cost Mm -hmm. $1.10 together. The bat bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? 5.001 cents. (laughs) All right. so, (laughs) So those who did not take the time to consider the question said the answer was 10 cents because it really seems obvious that it's 10 cents when you just do a quick brush, right? Mm-hmm. This, the, the baseball bat is a dollar more than the ball. So what's left, there's 10 cents left over the ball. The ball costs 10 cents. But the answer is actually 5 cents. The answer is 5 yeah, nickel, cents. right. Now, why, yes. why is that, Evan? Ooh, because you're starting with something that's equal – and then you're adding a dollar more to to one of the two items. And if your cap is 110, you subtract and you're adding the dollar, you're left with 10 cents. You have to divide that equally among the two things that you're looking at, five cents each. And Steve, you said you knew the answer to this, right? Yeah, this is a, this is a classic question to illustrate this very thing where you, the heuristic of going for the obvious answer, but not thinking one level deeper. Like there's, there's a false but alluring answer. You know, mm-hmm. and that people will jump to. So this is this is a classic example. So yeah, I knew before once you said baseball, I knew exactly where, where you were going. <laughs> so quick decision makers showed that they're also poor gamblers because they would accept bets that had worse odds. Again, because they're not thinking about it. The underlying explanation for this behavior is that the quick decision makers accept and act on thoughts that come to mind easily and on the spot, right? Mm-hmm. So let's call this a low energy state of thinking. Taking the time to find, analyze, and consider information is a high-energy state of thinking, and it is. This explains why I'm so tired all the time. Uh, Anyway, people who make quick decisions and those who don't both were initially filled with the low-energy thoughts. The difference Mm -hmm. is that people who make quick decisions are less likely to move on to the high-energy type of thinking. So they're they're stuck in the rut of accepting the low-energy type of thinking. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's like a habit almost. It, and it is, it pretty much is a habit because you could train yourself out of it. The high energy thinkers were able to move past their own cognitive biases and form stronger conclusions because, to put it bluntly, they do the work. They do the necessary work to get there. They, they didn't stop with their initial low energy thinking. They decided to continue 
and, 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 you know, and probe further. The researchers found that training low-energy thinkers could help them start to overcome their biases and be more deliberate in their thought processes. This is really cool. Think about that. Like they actually figured out a way. It wasn't that complicated, but they did come up with a process to train these people to get at, out of their own way. They used puzzles you know, that would focus on specific kinds of cognitive bias. And then they show the subject the specific mistake that they made and instruct them how to overcome it, right? It's very specific. You know, this, this, t- this puzzle is specific to this specific cognitive bias. They do it. They make, the, they make the mistake. They show them the exact little mistake that they made. Now, they're not saying to them things like, you know, you're, every, the way you think is wrong. They're just fixing a little bit at a time. You know, it's a very stepladder type of process that they have to go through. But they did show results where the person could retain the information that they learned and kind of overcome their cognitive biases. Now, an extreme version of this, like we, like I said earlier, is you know, you're a full-blown conspiracy theorist and you're taking shortcuts on, the, on getting to answers, you know. And, and again, like Steve was saying, you know, because it feels good, because it makes – it gives you – it confirms things that you already believe. It makes you feel good about the world. At least it makes you feel like you have control over things. So you go to you, – you know, you, you default to the, the conclusions that you already agree with. It's hard to tell yourself that you're wrong. It's hard to force yourself to have intellectual humility. You know, it's hard to spend the time – chugging through and, and really turning something over in your head. It does physically take – you burn more calories to do it. It's harder to do. So this is this is interesting to me because it quantifies something that we all already kind of knew, but it, it kind of shines a bright light on it and explains like what's actually going on in, in the thought processes of people who – legitimately don't take the time to think. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the fascinating new bit here is, is you know, as you say, showing, you know, quantitatively that people who jump to conclusions, who take the superficial answer, how, you know, that correlates with conspiracy thinking and belief in the paranormal, et cetera. But, you know, these kinds of studies are so hard to interpret because there are so many confounding factors. For example, it's already well established that people who believe in conspiracy theories and believe in the paranormal are more intuitive thinkers and less analytical thinkers. Mm-hmm. So are we just, is this a, just one more way to measure the difference between intuitive and analytical thinking, right? Because analytical thinkers, by definition, break things down and analyze them and do the, the thinking, whereas the intuitive thinkers are gut feeling thinkers. So this is not new when, when you just say, well, okay, well, this is just, they're just measuring intuitive versus analytical thinking. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, look, there, this entire thing, I think, makes it a little bit more clear, particularly for me, what it means to be a skeptic and, and you know, yeah. that we take it further, that we've trained ourselves to not stop at a low energy state of thinking, which is essentially your gut, like whatever your brain yeah. spits out into your conscious mind first. We, we've trained ourselves to ignore that. You know, like it's still there. It's still happening. You still feel it. But we move quickly past it to the point where you almost don't perceive that it's there anymore because we just don't operate that way anymore. We've trained ourselves to to think and consider things on a on a, on a deeper level. That's it. I mean, that is an, a, one of the core things of being a skeptic. Do you think it it boils down to that what you just said that they're that the ver- analytical versus more intuitive thinker? Do, do you feel that it, is at its core? That's a strong signal in the research. And, right. So I guess it's, it's complicated. It's not going to be ever be any one thing. Remember, the, this kind of research, you develop a construct, right? You develop a paradigm of research that you think is going to be shining light on a question that you have. But this is the marshmallow test, right? You think you think you're testing executive function when you're in testing. You're really testing how confident they are in their environment. Like, if you oh, remember right. that? Yeah, like they. Can, right. you, you think that they're, you're measuring, can they defer gratification, but you're really measuring, do they have reliable parents, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And mm. the behavior effect can be the same. But in any case, with this, I think this is adding a new wrinkle to it, but it does totally fit within previous research, which shows, you know, that there is this correlation. And maybe what this is doing is explaining that correlation Further, the reason why analytical thinking correlates with 
not, you know, believing conspiracy theories and you know, paranormal and magical beliefs, et cetera, is because you don't just listen to your gut. You go, you know, deeper and do statistical analysis and think about plausibility and et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the only thing I'd push back on a little bit is that I don't think you necessarily have to ignore your intuition. That's data. Your intuition is data, mm-hmm. but you just have to put it into perspective. You have to know that it's, it's like, okay, interesting. That's my initial reaction. So that may be telling me something, but let me, let me see if I can confirm that with an analytical approach. And right. And you'll find that some, so the, the intuition, it gives you like a little bit of a head start, but it can't be your final answer. You got to back it up with, an, with analytical thinking. And, you know, and I'll, and I'll just say the reason, part of the reason that I, you know, have, you know, read so much about this literature is because this is at the absolute core of medical training, right? Of, of mm. being a, which is what I am, you know, I teach medical students, you know, re- residents, et cetera. It, you know, right at the core of that is the intuitive versus analytical approach to diagnosis and treatment, et cetera, to, to clinically evaluating a patient. And you don't want to completely ignore your like gestalt gut reaction to a patient, but you have to understand that that's not the final word. Mm -hmm. It leads you astray. You have to know how it leads you astray. And you have to, you, you boils down to what we call predictive value. At the end of the day, you need to know how predictive something is. Not just does this look like a heart attack, but what features predict that it is a heart attack you know, a heart attack. You know what I mean? That, so you have to back it up with the analytical number crunching analysis. Yep. But uh, so there's a more, a little bit more of a complicated relationship between intuition and analytical thinking. But you know, the, the problem that we're seeing is the people who don't do the analytical thinking, they stop with the intuitive yep. gut feeling. And then, so you're basically living in a world of heuristics and cognitive biases. Right? That's right. And it becomes a trap. Totally. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. All right. I Thanks, Jay. So, you, Bob, I know you're into nanotechnology, right? A little bit, a lot of it. Yeah, only on right. a small scale, though. Nanotechnology mm-hmm. is cool, but it, it is also definitely a buzzword. Oh yeah, and, yeah. like blockchain. Yeah, yeah, like space age technology. You know, oh, that, yeah, that, any, that, anything after 19 what 57? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why they created the term Sputnik. molecular nanotechnology. To, to distinguish it from just the buzzword of nanotech, you know. So I'm going to tell you a, a news item that deals with the non-molecular nanotechnology. It's the a medical use of nanoparticles to stop internal bleeding. Cool. Okay. To, or at least to slow down internal bleeding. So this is a pretty interesting use. And again, the, the, the nanotechnology part of it is almost incidental. But you get, incidental. So what, what counts as a nanoparticle? There, there is a specific definition. And yeah. so just to quickly go over that, so, so uh, nano, nanostructures or nanotechnology involves anything that has one dimension that's 100 nanometers or less, right? So if one of the three physical dimensions is in that scale, you know, less than or equal to 100 nanometers, that's a nano sheet. If, it, even if one of the other two dimensions is a lot longer than the other, then that's a nano ribbon, right? If two dimensions are less than 100 nanometers, that's a nanofiber, or if it's hollow, it's a nanotube. And if all three dimensions are less than 100 nanometers, that's a Whoa. nanoparticle, right? So nanosheet, okay. nanotube, yeah. or fiber, and nanoparticle. So this is dealing with nanoparticles, which means every dimension is less than 100 nanometers, except they're stretching the definition of nanoparticle up to 500 nanometers. Oh, okay. You know, it's a, it's a, the shorthand is it's in nanoparticle-ish, I guess. So, but in these nanoparticles, there's two types of nanoparticles that have been studied basically as an injection that would, the idea is it would go to the site of an internal injury and staunch the bleeding from inside the blood vessel, right? So there's two types of, of particles uh, that are being studied, synthetic and biological. So synthetic are completely fabricated and biological are, are either parts of cells or parts of organelles. There's a recent study looking at a synthetic nanoparticle now, I say synthetic, it doesn't mean it's made of a machine. It's still a liposome, right? It's a fat bubble with protein fragments on the outside, right? So it's still built like out of the stuff of life, but it's completely, you know, artificially made. So there's been already been quite a bit of research about this, but we, we're, it's early days and some of the basics haven't been worked out yet. So what the study was looking at is what is the optimal size of an artificial nanoparticle 
a synthetic nanoparticle, specifically a synthetic hemostatic nanoparticle, for reducing internal bleeding in a, say, a acute trauma setting. That's it. I just want to know what, what size should we, we be making these things. So they looked at essentially small, medium, and large mm-hmm. sized hemostatic nanoparticles, you know, like so less than 100 nanometers at the low end, you know, 500 nanometers at the big end, and like 150 to 200 nanometers in the medium size, the, the middle range. And they found that uh, the, me- the medium size, the middle of the range, like the 150 nanometers, was the optimal size for the nanoparticles they were studying, you know, again, made from the fat bubbles with proteins on them. So there's, there's a couple of reasons why size matters in this case, right? One is you do not want your synthetic nanoparticles to be filtered out of the blood, right? We don't want them to accumulate in the spleen, the liver, the liver. or the lungs, right? Because all of those organs can filter stuff from the blood. You know, the lungs filter out clots, the spleen filters out, you know, dead blood cells, uh, for example. Um, so you so it can recognize it separate from the blood and it would try to take those particles out. Well, the, it's just a matter of, it's again, it's, it's a passive system, right? It's not, it, so it's just a matter of, are these particles big enough that they would get filtered out by these organs. Oh, gotcha. Okay, right. So physical, right. just the physical size, right, right. Yeah, and these particles are passive too. They're not doing anything. They're just going with the flow, you know. It's, they're not machines, you know. It's just a really just a fat bubble. So uh, the, the bigger particles get accumulated in those organs, right, the spleen, liver, and right. lungs. So that's not good. You want it to accumulate at the site of injury, not in these organs. The smaller ones did not get filtered out Uh, But the problem was the other main factor. So ideally, what you want these particles to do, you guys know what platelets are? Yeah. Uh, Yes, blood platelets. Yeah, their blood platelets are cell fragments in your blood. They gather at the site of a of a bleed. Uh, You know, if you if you have a a artery or vein or whatever, a cut is and it's leaking the platelets would tend to accumulate at that site and they stick to each other. And it basically just forms a plug that blocks the bleeding. So what these nanoparticles are designed to do is to accumulate at the site of a bleed and help the platelets stick together. But you don't want the nanoparticles sticking to each other too much because then you just get a clump of these nanoparticles and they don't work as well by themselves. You, what, you, what you want is for mm. them to stick to the platelets. So then you have basically oh, a mesh... Wow. That's of just <laughs> some of the nanoparticles, but mainly platelets. Like that's the optimal configuration. The, so the super small particles just clumped together with each other, and they were not as good at incorporating the platelets right into the plug. The bigger ones got filtered out, so they weren't good. So the medium-sized mm-hmm. ones was the Goldilocks, just right, you know. So they were <laughs> able to. They 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 did not get filtered out um, too quickly. They they mostly accumulated at the site of the bleed, and they mostly stuck to platelets. And so the, in the, the clot that formed to stop the bleeding was mostly platelets, which is exactly what you want. So they, they basically found the sweet spot for the size of these particles. Now, how well did they work? Well, they studied this in a rat model. What they did was they made a lethal slice in the vena cava of the, of the rat. So that's the largest vein in the body, the one that empties into the right side of the heart. And, you know, untreated, the rat would bleed out, right? That's, mm-hmm. That was the point of the, t- of the study of somebody with a lethal internal bleed, especially ones where, like, you cannot slow the bleeding with pressure. They actually even talk about non-compressible injuries or non-compressible internal hemorrhages. Then they, they gave some rats just normal saline as a control and then they gave other rats the nanoparticles the hemostatic nanoparticles of the different sizes and they said how long do they live you know basically is is there any increase in survival and the uh the nanoparticles of the optimal size did increase the two hour survival you know for the rats it wasn't a home run in terms of how well they worked but they did they did improve survival uh, in, in the rats that had them. Basically a proof of concept thing, again, just trying to dial in for future research. 
you know, before we get to human studies, we want to know as much as we can about this. But these are these are legit nanoparticles, and nanoparticle technology, nanoparticles are becoming definitely an important medical technology. And this is this is a, a very interesting application. They're being used to del- for drug delivery, for example, mm-hmm. for for to target drugs to a specific location. Like if you could design the nanoparticle to go to the part of the body that you want, and then release. The, you know the drug uh, attack the cancer there. cells only exactly just release it when you hit the cancer cells that's you know that that kind of nanoparticle targeting is an active area of research we may have mentioned you know some of those studies previously on the show uh, and this is again i think this is the where the low hanging fruit is right because all you got to do is inject it into into a blood vessel and then have it do its thing just passively and it's just a matter of dialing in, you know, like calibrating what proteins do we want to put on the surface? How big do we want the liposome to be? And once we like dial that in as much as possible, then we'll study it in people. And we don't have to worry about like uh, increased rates of infection because of the size themselves, like they're too small to, to be a catalyst for any kind of infection, anything like that. No, no, I mean, these won't, no, these won't cause an infection. What they can do, though, is cause an immune re- rejection. But that's where the, um, the biological nanoparticles are more likely to do that. The synthetic nanoparticles don't really provoke an immune response. So that's gotcha. the, the big advantage of the synthetic ones. Mm. Uh, the biological ones are easier to make, you know, because they're just, just taking pieces of stuff that already exists. But they can be, they, they can be immunogenic. Uh, as we mm-hmm. said, it can provoke an immune response. The synthetic ones, not so much. And, you know, again, we, the synthetic ones, can we can tailor them more specifically. Like we could design them down to the last detail. Yeah, so this is, re- you know, this nanoparticle technology is, is a burgeoning area of medicine. If this all works out, again, the infamous five to 10 years, but that's I, that would be my estimate of when we would be actually having patients in like yeah. an emergency room setting or in an ambulance getting injected with these nanoparticles just because that's how long the, you know the research is going to take and that's assuming that things go well right so that's like the short horizon it could be longer if there's like unanticipated side effects or other sort of challenges that have to be worked out and again i think it's the kind of thing where it's going to be an incremental improvement you know like yeah, people are 10% more likely to survive if they get these injections, something like that, okay. or 20% or something okay. like that. It's good. I mean, yeah, you're talking about survival. And yeah. of course, you know, trauma is the number one cause of death in people under 45, you know, so for, for oh, in terms wow. of yeah. lost uh, life years, the trauma is huge. And uh, it just it's completely unrelated. I just read today a statistic that that gun-related trauma for the first time in the U.S. now has exceeded Automobiles, automobile accident trauma. Oh yeah. my God! I'm not yeah, of course, less people yeah. driving, more people shooting. Unfortunately, but that includes you know death by suicide on the gun violence end. That's ah, like, that's right, still right. that's like where most of them are. But makes it too in, easy. In any right? case, yeah, internal bleeding is bad because you can't you know until you are in the OR, right? There's not much you can do about it. So you know, anything that slows down the bleeding, that's the idea. You just, you, this is not going to be a cure unto itself. You're just trying to buy time to get to the yeah. OR. That's basically the idea here. All right, Evan, tell us about this vision of the future. It's kind of a theme this week. Vision of the <laughs> Internet in 2035. That was the exact title of a recently published report by the Pew Research Center, Visions of the Internet in 2035. Hmm. You know, whenever I... Now nah, I'm conditioned now, guys. Whenever I see or hear the year 2035, I can't help but think back to our SGU in the future episode. Oh, God. That was and we yeah, turned, 2035. It was. Yeah. yeah. We role-played ourselves recording a podcast in 2035. And I think some of the most fun we had in preparing that episode was trying to reasonably predict the state of technology in 2035. And uh, especially so when it came to the internet. You know, we, we came up with the title, The Aug. Right, for augmented reality. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was cool, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. And I don't know, do you think what Facebook and Meta are doing is taking an initial sort of step in that direction? You know, VR and AR becoming all into- incorporated. I think, you know, they were onto something, sort of what we were also thinking about. Um, here's what Pew did. Here's what Pew, Pew Research Center did. They asked several hundred people who are prominent in the fields of technology and industry. I mean, these are people who 
are described as innovators, developers, business and policy leaders, researchers, and activists. Um, also keep in mind, this is not a poll. Uh, as Pew described it as a non-scientific canvassing based on a non-random sample. The results represent only the opinions of the individuals who responded to the queries, and they are not projectable to any other population. Okay, so this is like a closed sort of system. So keep that in mind. Here is what they were asked. We invite you to imagine a better world online. What is one example of an aspect of digital life that you think could be different in 2035 than it is today? We invite you to create a vignette of something you would like to see taking place in a new and improved digital realm in 2035. Your example might involve politics or social activities or jobs or physical and mental health or community life or education. Feel free to think expansively and specifically. That was it. That's what they were asked. And they received 434 responses. And Pew analyzed the responses, you know, as a means of sort of organizing the key themes that were expressed by the respondents. And, you know, so here, here were the key changes that, or the categories, essentially, that they, for the most part, fell into, or they were able to categorize. There was a lot of feedback regarding these topics. Um, building better spaces was one of the categories. And basically that meant, you know, new platforms that codify norms for discourse and also artificial intelligence to help isolate bad actors. Uh, they had another category called constructing effective communities, which when I read the description, it sort of was similar to me as the building better spaces category in, in sure. a sense. So kind of an extension of that. Although a community and a space could be different because a community could be spread out over multiple spaces. Right. And a space could be used for multiple communities. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, yes. Right. So one basically ties in essentially with the other, but yeah. they are, but they are still distinct. They're distinct. Yeah. Yep. Another category or that it fell into empowering individuals, which means better agency and autonomy and the use of tools to help with those ends, such as blockchain, localized mesh networks. Bob, you know anything about mesh networks? I think, yeah, they're, yeah, they're awesome. I do, I yeah, I have one, yeah. I have one in my house. They're fantastic. Yeah, me too. Um, so that's for empowering individuals. Another category, changing economic life and work. This one, you know, working remotely. That seemed, that's the way things are definitely going. And, and, ex and as a result, expanding job eligibility, expansion of jobs based on the fact that people will have more of a remote environment to work in. Uh, mm -hmm. Two more categories, altering reality, of course, virtual reality and augmented reality, along with some concerns about unforeseen or unforeseeable abuses, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And finally, tackling wicked problems, you know, the big ones, climate change, human rights, global health issues, sort of the, the macro problems that uh, we as a globe are all having to deal with. So, uh, yeah, there was some pretty impressive people on the on the list with some uh, real high credentials and expertise in these in these areas that all gave their feedback. And it went in a lot of different directions. Um, what, mm. what do you guys I mean, you guys have thought about this, right? And I can't imagine. Sure. And, and I imagine this also takes up some space in the upcoming book. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some big brushstroke trends that we could probably confidently predict. I do think there'll be increasing incorporation of augmented reality for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And more VR as the technology improves. I don't think it's going to replace just using a monitor. There's just something really you know, easy and convenient about sitting in front of a screen and using a keyboard. And you know what I mean? Uh, but, I, we will, but you will uh, incorporate them more uh, into our everyday use. Um, I think there'll be uh, mixed reality, right? So mixed reality is where all of these things blend together. I think that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's sort of the idea of the, of the metaverse, where there's one place where all these things can interact simultaneously. And whether that you think that's premature or not, I think that's where things are headed. In terms of the spaces, you know, it's it's still the Wild West. I think it's still going to be right. the Wild West 15 years. I think we'll see everything. The idea of using AI to make spaces which are more um, curated or managed is, is I think we'll see that. With a, will they dominate? Who knows? Maybe we might see more segregation like there'll be not just like a few giant spaces but there'll be many more spaces that people utilize in different sub communities or different purposes yay more echo chambers yeah, yeah you know, Bob, i think well, true. we already kind of 
separate out by age. Uh, there's attempts to separate out by worldview. Well, I don't know if that's, there's still power in having um, numbers, you know what I mean? So having a lot of breakaway spaces may not be a viable option. They'll exist, but I just, you know, I don't know how important that they'll be. I don't think we're going to solve the problems that we had that the internet causes. It'll just be more of the same. And what I think the real innovation is going to be is something nobody's thought of. Mm-hmm. Someone's going to come up with something that no one's thought of, you know, that we'll, we'll be talking about in, in 2035 that we can't even think about right now. So I think that's very likely. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, to your point, and certainly something I thought about as well, are what I vision in my head as these as these bubbles, or as you put them, echo chambers. I think we're going to, in a way, sort of have to see more of that. I mean, I like, I like, certainly like the idea or the ideal coming up with a future product, whether you call it the internet or the AUG or whatever you're going to call it, that codifies sort of these norms for discourse and allows people to, you know, have reasonable, rational discussions and all that. But, you know, you sort of are counting on human beings changing their behaviors in a lot of ways. And I I, I don't foresee that happening in, in, the, in a short term, like 2035. So in a way, you are sort of going to have these people who are only going to want to occupy certain places, certain bubbles, as I'm seeing it in my head, in which they can go and spout whatever crazy that they want but hopefully it will not have a overreaching infection to the entire system at large and it can be contained and isolated captured in 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 certain segments of of that future i hope mm. all right bob you're going to give us a quickie thank you steve gird your loins everyone <laughs> this is your quickie with bob <laughs> this week is ai and nuclear fusion the swiss plasma center has one of the few operating Tokamaks, tokamaks for fusion. Let me start over. The Swiss Plasma Center has one of the few operating tokamaks for fusion research, which combines super hot plasma using donut shaped magnetic fields. Uh, we've talked about that a bunch of times. Um, this test bed is special, though, since it's a variable configuration tokamak, allowing for many different plasma configurations. How cool is that? I hadn't heard about that before. But you need to run new plasma config- configurations on a simulator first. Because you don't want to melt the walls of your tokamak, right, when you're testing some new plasma configuration. you got to do your homework on the simulator, and then you can go real with it. This is where their collaboration with DeepMind comes in, which, shame on you if you don't remember, is a world-famous neural net technology that uses deep reinforcement learning. You may remember it from such amazing hits as AlphaZero and AlphaGo Zero, which are the literal superhuman champs of chess and Go. And also I'll throw in AlphaFold. I mean, it's just like such an amazing thing. So after training on the simulator, DeepMind can now not only create but maintain a host of different plasma configurations, especially one in which two separate plasma shapes are controlled at the same time in the tokamak which is really sweet. I never even thought that was possible. So these dynamic, complex, closed-loop control systems seem to be yet another domain where DeepMind could be amazing, tremendous help to humanity and, and help in the transition of cool sci-fi technology into real everyday technology that is really important to me. Loins ungirded, this has been your Quickie with Bob. I hope it was good for you too. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All right, Jay, it's Who's That Noisy Time. Okay, guys, last week I played this noisy. Sultlicher was your warden, thaw he thaw weron, here dagas weron ye fullede, that heo kende, and heo kende here frum. All right, guys, what is this? That's Elrond uh, speaking in, um, you know, El- Elvish. Exactly, exactly, like a, yes. The cousin of C3PO. Any other guesses? <laughs> it did sound Anthony Daniels ish. It's like English, but not English. That's true. It's not. Well, that's a good <laughs> starting point, Steve. Ye old English or something? Oh, Steve. I think <laughs> Is it? Is it? Uh, Language <laughs> dialect simulator. A listener named Damien wrote in and said, Hello, I recognize some of the Latin spoken in this week's noisy. and I am unable to translate all of it, but I'm pretty sure I heard the words sons, daughters. My guess will be that this is some sort of religious ceremony, possibly Catholic. You are heading in the right direction, but you are not correct next listener i uh, guess michael blaney he says was this esperanto <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no if not sounded cool either way. Sound way 
That is not Esperanto, the made-up language that William Shatner is one of four people who have learned it. <laughs> I, gotta, I, I, I haven't heard that. I forget what that sounds like. I'd like to go back and hear people talking in that. Yeah, YouTube it. And, and listen, we know Esperanto is a legitimate language. You don't have to email us. We're just kidding. <laughs> yes. We're joking. Yeah. Next listener, Joshua Gillespie wrote in, says, Hi, Jay. Is this week's noisy someone speaking Lojban, L-O-J-B-A-N? Lojban is a constructed syntactically unambiguous human language created by the logical language group it succeeds the logland project the logical language group began developing lojban in 1987 so another constructed language which is that's fun yeah so people think that this sounds a little bit like a made-up language that's interesting I'm going to click right over to the winner, and I will tell you we had more winners on this one than I can remember in a long time. A lot of people got this right. The winner for this week is Jason Mackey, and Jason said, hey, Jay, it sounds like Old English to me. And oh, indeed, there you go. it is Old English. Old Abandoned English. So I got a, an interesting email right right after the I read the winning email. I got an email from someone named Jonathan Phillip, who happens to be Kara's Wait, said, Kara's Lyft driver. Oh. He wrote in. Remember that guy? Yeah. So, so he wrote in and he said, uh, he said, I'm, the, I'm Kara's Lyft driver from a couple of weeks ago back on the show. It was nice surprise to get a shout out on the show. I just think it's funny that Kara's Lyft driver is calling in and emailing the show, whatever. Anyway, he guessed for this week and he said he had a professor that made us recite the first 18 lines of the Canterbury Tales in Old English. This sounds similar to both <laughs> in the pronunciation and meter. So he did guess correctly. So I just wanted to let Kara's Lyft driver know you have guessed correctly, my friend. Good job. So let's talk about what we just heard, though, guys. I'd like to see a period piece where all the actors are speaking Old English and they have subtitles. Yeah, that'd be cool. In Esperanto. Esperanto subtitles. (laughs) So I got a, a very detailed email from someone who knew exactly what this was, and I thought their description was so good that I'm going to read it to you. Um, and this is sent in by a listener named Kevin, Kevin the Linguist from Moscow, Russia. And he said, hope all is well awesome with you. This week's Who's That Noisy is someone reading a text in Old English, specifically the West Saxon dialect. Even more specifically, hmm. it's an extract from the 10th century Wessex Gospels, Luke 2.6 and 2.7, relating the story of the nativity. Um, and then he goes on to quote it. And it, it, very interesting. So he says, a cool noisy and... So that's cool. So we got a listener from Moscow who who hit the nail completely on the head. Exactly. You got it 100% correct. You just missed, you know, getting it being the winner by a few hours. Old English is the earliest form of the English language. It was spoken and written in Anglo-Saxon Britain from C450 CE until C1150. Long time ago. And my God, does that speak, sound like Elvish to you from Lord of the Rings? I mean, that is so Elven. I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, well, Elvin is was based on Welsh, right? I think you're right, Steve. I know I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a new noisy for well. you guys this week. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> you got to put in that noise at the end, or it's not legit. Oh, the whole <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, you got to like well, <sighs> got to take the breath. Yep. All right, guys, I got a new noisy this week from a listener named Bryce Groves, and here it is. <laughs> That's it. It's a short one, but it's a fun one. If you guys think you know what the noisy is, or, and very importantly, if you heard anything cool this week, just think of me for t- two seconds and pop me an email at WTN at the skeptics org. So before we go on to uh, our first question, we want to remind everybody that we have a couple of extravaganzas coming up. Yeah. So March 25th, we have a private show in New York City. Uh, that's where we record a live version of our podcast in front of a live audience. It's just always super fun. The next day, March 26th, we're doing an extravaganza. That's our stage show uh, hosted by George Robb, where we get up on stage. We do a lot of fun stuff. There's a lot of interaction with the audience. You get to challenge us in a skeptical trivia, science mm-hmm. trivia game that we came up with. All really cool. Then we we travel to Boston, March 27th. We do a private show in Boston and the extravaganza later that day. And we've just added a new event to our calendar, April 23rd in Bethlehem, PA. This is no show number two. Again, with George Robb, we're going to be doing a live recording of the SGU. And then we're going to be, George is going to, and his band are going to perform. 
and then we're going to do the first live boomer versus zoomer game show that we developed oh this is super fun yeah jay and ian have been working on all the the, the converting this digital game show into a live game show and making the podiums and the lights and the buzzers and all that stuff it's really gonna it's gonna be great a lot of fun so Go to the skepticsguide.org slash events. You'll see all of these uh, events listed there and you can uh, book tickets. Make sure you get them early before we, in case we get sold out, which, which happens quite frequently. And you know, this is a great way to support the SGU and everything that we do. And you get a little something out of it for yourself. Bring the whole family, bring your friends. It's a good introduction into the SGU. Um, all right, let's move on to some questions and emails. The first one comes from Martin from the Netherlands, and he writes, I've heard you saying that pet cats shouldn't go outside because they kill birds. While I do see the problem here, I fail to see why this measure, keeping cats inside, is the solution to the problem of birds dying. I can't imagine humans aren't the number one bird killers on this planet. Climate change, wind turbines, flying planes. And isn't a cat hunting outside part of its natural behavior? This and the obvious meat eater bias are my only two gripes with the show. Thanks for the great content, <laughs> Martin. Okay, so Martin, meaty, you are incorrect. <laughs> um, we do have some figures on this. So, what is the number one killer of birds? Cats. Cats. It is cats. Sure. By a huge margin. the The most recent data we have shows that again, this is sort of the middle of the estimate range. 2.4 billion birds killed each year by cats in the U.S. alone. 2.4 yeah. billion. That's crazy. These are from both feral and pet cats, you know, that are outdoor pet cats. What do you think is the number two cause of, Lightning. of Cat? birds dying? Oh, birds dying? Very, very small cats? Uh, other birds. It's not lightning. Not other birds. Well, it's a predator of some kind? Um, Kung fu. Windows. Yeah. Wow. Those damn windows. I would have thought of that eventually. Yeah. yeah. And the estimate there is kind of broad. It's somewhere between 300 million and 1 billion per year in the U.S. Oh. So at the, at the high end of that, it's, you know, it's, it's still less than half of what, what, bird, what cats kill, but it's significant. Everything else is pretty much a round-off error after birds and buildings, mm -hmm. you know? Was... He mentioned, you know, wind turbines. It's like it barely registers. Uh, like a, it's like a hundred thousand. It's nothing. It's like right, a, it's yeah. a when you think in in con, in the proportion to all the other things. High tension wires is like a hundred and fifty to two hundred million. Cars are less than everything else is pretty much less than a hundred million. Cars are like at sixty. Communication towers are like at fifty, sixty. So you know these are all significant. You know we want we don't want to have unnecessary you know, wildlife deaths because of you know our infrastructure our civilization but the two big ones are cats and buildings mm -hmm. for for buildings you know the the it's all about the technology of the glass we can fashion and we have the technology it's just a matter of incorporating we can it. rebuild him yeah in fact yeah, yeah there are new standards especially in cities i know new york city has yeah. re regulations about the types of glass you're allowed to install in the buildings they have to be bird protection bird you know reflective enough where the birds will be able to see that what's yes. going on instead of crashing into them yep, yep absolutely also steve what in the days when there weren't these buildings it makes you wonder what the bird population on the on the planet was at the time because yeah even though there were cats and things back then still killing them you know you how many more billions of birds must there had been in pre-industrial times Absolutely. The, the bird populations were much greater. And did and, and in those days, I mean, were the birds having a, a, a negative environmental impact? Like, were they eating too many no. berries or, you know, no, they, causing they were other in, species? They to... were in equilibrium with their environment. OK. You know, just that, that equilibrium was just many more birds. There was also many more bird species, you know. Yes. It was much more di much greater diversity. Oh, wow. Now, another another big threat. See, this this is a threat to bird diversity without necessarily being a threat to bird populations, and that's invasive species. Um, so, like, for example, the European um, starling has displaced a lot of domestic species. You'll see hundreds, thousands of European starlings on the side of the road or in these in giant flocks. And, you know, th there's lots of native species that they've displaced, like the northern flicker, right? They, they literally kick them out of their, their, their nests. The uh, house sparrow is another invasive species. 
you know, they're all over the place. These, these are just birds that thrive really well in human civilization. But they're very, they were just aggressive birds that don't have real competition. I want to address the, and isn't a cat hunting outside part of its natural behavior? No, because cats are domesticated animals. They are not a natural part of the ecosystem. They are little predators. And, you know, we at the very best, you can consider them an invasive species, like feral cats are an invasive species. And, you know, introducing a top level predator into an environment, you know, one that can you know breed very quickly and, you know, can be very, very successful has devastating effects on an ecosystem. So no, they're not a natural part. It's not like, it's not like outdoor cats evolved as part of the natural North American ecosystem. That is not true at all. It is something that humans introduced. We did have one listener email and say, well, what, you know, what about cats farms who are used for vermin control? And it's like, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. And, you know, I didn't really say it explicitly, but the outdoor cat problem is really greatest for the suburbs, right? So in the cities, Mm -hmm. you know, there's there's not that much wildlife to begin with. Because in the country... if you live on, there's not that, there's just not that many, yeah, just not that many farms, you know, compared to the population in the suburbs. So, if it was just a matter of cat, you know, outdoor cats in a rural setting killing mice and rats, that's that would not be an issue. It's the, you know, the hundreds of millions of cats living in the suburbs where they have access to nature, and there's a high concentration of them. That's where that's where the the damage is being done. All right, guys, let's move on to science or fiction. It's time for science or fiction. Each week I come up with three science news items or facts, two genuine and one fake. And I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. Uh, we just have three items this week, no theme or anything. You guys ready? I'm yes. Ready. Do All it. Right. Here we go. Item number one, astronomers have detected two supermassive black holes orbiting each other at the center of a distant galaxy and are the closest such binary with an orbital period of just two years. Item number two, a new analysis finds that global farmland use could be cut 37 to 48 percent globally with the adoption of optimal farming practices. And item number three, a new study finds that the impact that caused the KPG extinction that killed the dinosaurs occurred at three in the afternoon, plus or minus 90 minutes. Jay, go first. All right. The first one here, astronomers have detected two supermassive black holes orbiting each other at the center of a distant galaxy and are the closest such binary with any, with an orbital period of just two years. Okay. So I'm assuming that there's something novel about the orbital period being just two years. And these are super massive black holes. Yeah, I just wouldn't put anything past weirdness in, uh, you know, in the universe like this. You know, like, sure, there's got to be two super massive black holes orbiting each other that have some weird properties. So that one is probably science. The second one, a new analysis finds that global farmland use could be cut 37 to 48 percent globally with the adoption of optimal farming farming practices. Yeah, this is really cool. So there are farming practices where they are like growing crops on an angle, you know, so there's like a crop and then right behind it, there's another crop on an angle from the ceiling going down to the floor and, it, you know, and they, they spray them with nutrient rich water and they're not using soil. So there, there's a lot of. Well, so just to be clear, this is, does not include hydroponics or anything like that. Mm. This is, you know, farming in the dirt. Okay. All right. Well, that's good clarification because that's where and I was going. And also, because right. you're going first, I'll make sure this is current practice. This is not. A, this does not mean future technology or anything. This is just with uh, optimal current farming practices. Okay. So that being said, Steve, that says though that most farms are not using optimal farming practices, which I wouldn't doubt. But man, thirty-seven to forty-eight percent—that's huge, and we need that, right? We're moving into you know a time where. Arable land is is used. That's it. There is not much unused arable land out there. So if that's the case, man, I'd be surprised to think that you know possibly almost fifty percent of the farming that's going on out there. No, I shouldn't say it that way. Bottom line is that this is a big deal, and this one is definitely a, a potential fiction to me. A new study finds that the impact that causes the K 
PG extinction that killed the dinosaurs occurred at 3 in the afternoon, plus or minus 90 minutes. Get out of here. There's no way we know that. How could we possibly know what time this happened? Think, let me think about this. You see me? I see it. Steve, I went right past gut, and now I'm analyzing. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> nice, analytical. Jay. It's what we got to do, right? <laughs> yep. I mean, you'd lose this game if you, if you go with your gut. How could we possibly I know? Would, I would disagree with that. At three in the afternoon. <laughs> what? Three in the afternoon in what time zone? What are you talking about? How can this possibly be science? It's I am going to be so that, pissed if this is science. He means it, where the strike the happened, pos- right? The sun position. Yeah, where the strike happened, the sun was in the position that we would consider at three in the afternoon. So, 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 yeah, it's, it's, so, yeah, okay, I get that. I understand that. But still, Steve, I could believe that some researchers, quote unquote researchers, did a study that found this. I just don't know if this is true. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, oh, yeah. I know you're putting it to us like it's, it's, you know, it's science or fiction. But I think if this one is considered the science, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the study was good <laughs> because this is insane. <laughs> How could I not pick that one? But of course, Evan, we know what he, Steve's doing. He knew that we were all going to freak out about that one. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so my gut is telling me to go with number two, the farming <laughs> one, but my intellect is telling me to go with number three. Steve said that you shouldn't ignore your gut, so I'm gonna. Uh, I gotta go with the. I gotta go with the canine impact. There's no KPG. There's no way. There's no way that anybody came to three in the afternoon with, with when it happened. Thank you. That's mine. Okay, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Jay, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So in order, supermassive black holes orbiting each other, the center of a distant galaxy. Bob, I imagine you have a pretty good fix on what, what exactly is going on here. Uh, the orbital period of just two years. I mean, you know, these are some extraordinary things that, you know, on the surface uh, would seem to be like, what? No way. But the world of astronomy detects all sorts of things nowadays. And why why couldn't this be one of those new discoveries? Um, distant galaxy, sure. Okay, so yeah, even though it's fantastic in a way, but I don't think it's wrong. So I'll say that's science. Now, the one about farmland use could be cut 37 to 48% globally with the adoption of optimal farming practices. The problem, if my memory, unless my memory is failing me, it very well could be. Uh, haven't we talked a lot, or Steve, you've talked about optimal farming practices and oh gosh i mean where we are currently we're using i know we're using just about all the land we possibly can right now on the planet to do the farming but sure not all of it's optimized but to get to optimize it to the point where you would get to almost 48 percent that's doubling your output i mean really cran- that's a huge i mean that is enormous that's an enormous jump you know, and I, I don't think I have a feeling this one's going to be the fiction because uh, I don't I think that's too extreme crunch. Yeah, we can. There are things we can do to make it better. I don't know that it touches that range, 37 to 48 percent. Um, and then on the last one about the extinction and how it could possibly be measured at three in the afternoon. Uh, one guess I'll take is that flowers, among other plants and things, I think have distinguishing features at certain times of day, and if anything was able to be sort of deemed to have been re- seen within that boundary examination in which they can see that, okay, some sort there was some sort of plant that would have had to have been open at this point of the day to receive more sunlight, that kind of thing. It would have had to have been this time of the day. That's where my mind is going on this. They found something. They found some signature in the boundary. That leads to something that was alive that was able to pinpoint it to that time, I think. So I'm going to say the farmland use one. I'll say that one's fiction. Okay, and Bob? See, supermassive black hole. I've never heard of of supermassive black holes, a binary pair of them. It's typically, you know, mid-size or small black holes, you know, in terms of like what, 10, 50, whatever solar masses, but supermassive? Never heard of it. I want it to be true, and Ooh. it it will be thus. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Obvious. second one, thirty seven to forty eight, sounds way too high. Perhaps perhaps when you factor in the the, the global global farmland, uh, then then I guess that does make more sense. But it still sounds 
sounds huge to me, and I would normally just pick that. But this um, number three, though, the um, the extinction, KPG extinction at three in the afternoon, I'm, I'm not buying that. That's fiction. Okay, so you guys all agree on the first one, so we'll start there. Astronomers have detected two supermassive black holes orbiting each other at the center of a distant galaxy and are the closest such binary with an orbital period of just two years. You guys all think this one is science, and this one is science. Yep, this is cool. Nice. Um, yeah, it's pretty much everything out there. What is, this is the second, as far as I can tell, this is the only the second supermassive black hole binary discovered. Oh, I hadn't heard the, about the first one. Okay. Well, the, it wasn't mentioned in the write-up of this news item. They just said this was the first one. But I think they said this is the first one in such a close-knit orbit. But they didn't say explicitly. But there's there's another one that's just not in a close-knit orbit. So the I, so I searched on it, and I found a report from 2017 saying that this was, that was the first time that supermassive black holes have been found that orbit each other. Must have been a merged long... galaxy. Galaxies. You're absolutely correct, but that's that's we're getting there. The, right. So what do you think the orbital period of that pair is? Uh, from twenty seventeen? Yeah. Two hundred. The years. first one discovered. Thirty thousand years. Oh yeah, so that's like Oh nine. nice. Wow. They're they're like they're twenty four light years apart. So this two years these are like right next to each other. That's just like this right is now, just yeah. unbelievable. That's a, that's a tango, man. Absolutely. Uh, so this is unprecedented in terms of being so close for supermassive yeah. black. What kind of forces yeah, are the black holes? Supermassive, lots of binaries. Can you imagine yes. the gravitational waves when they merge? <laughs> oh. When do you think they're going to merge? Gee, two, <sighs> if they're only two know, years man. apart, like I that. I don't know. 10,000 years. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's so awesome. 10,000 years. In 10,000 10, years. Bob wants it now. <laughs> when these two suckers collide, this will be Boom. a colossal gravitational wave. How like, far away are they? Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's 10,000 years as we perceive them, right? Mm. So, right. You know, but they are 9 billion light years. It already happened. happened. The gravitational waves are on their way. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Quick, send yourself an email in the future. I don't so want to wait that long, them, man. We will observe them colliding in about 10,000 years, and that will be just colossal, titanic gravitational waves uh, across the universe. So, yeah. So wow. future astronomers <laughs> can keep an eye out for that. All right. Let's go to – and, Bob, they said, yeah, this is probably multiple galaxies. Gotta multiple, be. multiple galaxies colliding with each other. All right. Let's go on to number three, actually. A new study hmm. finds that the impact – that caused the KPG extinction that killed the dinosaurs occurred at 3 in the afternoon, plus or minus 90 minutes. Bob and Jay, you think this one is the fiction, and you think this one is science. So I was wondering if any of you were going to bring up the news item that we talked about not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago. Remember when they found the day? Yes. yes. Fossil evidence from the yes. very day. I remember that. that. The, yeah. That the asteroid hit. So oh, obviously... Yeah, so the asteroid hit, you know, the ocean and all of that water and everything sloshed across the land. Some of it settled in a basin and we found that basin with essentially fossils from creatures that died the day the asteroid Yeah, and it was high resolution, right? Earth. High res. Absolutely. It was a high res picture of the moment of impact. And so Anyway, I was that. I did not remember you that. that. You were hoping, you weren't you, Steve? No. I was because that would have made the whole thing so uh, much more plausible. Yes, this one is fiction. the fiction. Yes, the fiction. Sorry, Evan. But what is the real news item? The spring. They, the spring. <laughs> yes. They, they oh, Bob, you saw the news happened. item? I did. I did. Ah. It, it happened in the spring, and and they were uh, yeah, obviously in the northern hemisphere where it hit, and and they figured that out because of the bone. Pattern the pattern in the bones of the animal. Look at so, the bones. Yeah, they, so they they essentially grow faster in the spring, and then they reach their peak of density, and then they they get a little bit demineralized in the winter when they're not eating as much. And so they were on the increase, but hadn't reached their peak yet. So that's that looks like the spring, and because they're able to, they have many fossils to look at. They could correlate it, you know, among yeah. many different individuals and species, etc. So they were pretty confident that the asteroid hit in the spring. Isn't that amazing that we could know that? Yeah, 60, that's the whatever. Six there's also a possibility ago. it did happen at three in the afternoon. It is possible. But nobody but, has shown but, that. 
And, I'm gonna write. I'm I, gonna write a study and. It made me Say wonder, <laughs> like, how much more can we tell about that yeah. day from all the evidence that we have? Yeah, it's true. Know? Especially that basin, um, Steve. That's why I was thinking, man, because I, I saw the article about the spring. And I'm like, what are the odds that there was another story that I missed that's, that also pinpointed it at 3 p.m.? And, and that discovery you mentioned a couple of years ago could have potentially have done that. And if you got me with that, I would have hated you forever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I figured that was like <laughs> one click. That was one definite click beyond what the study was showing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was definitely pushing credibility. Jay's reaction was perfectly reasonable, but yeah. You know, again, if you remembered that fact, it's like that's. What I, I did, Steve, and that, that could yeah, have done it. Study. That could. Yeah. That that yeah. could have. That could have done it. I, I wouldn't have been shocked if that you know that that basin <laughs> showed it in some way. Uh, with something that they knew had to be a you know mid afternoon thing. The scientists yeah. need to look close. But yeah, but the <laughs> odds that there was another article also you know that w- the yeah. spring oh and by here's another study that said three that would have been too it's too well, much it to ask the, for. It, it could have been another finding from the same study that just wasn't prominently you know talked about in the uh, in the press release. Yeah, you know, they would have. They wouldn't have said spring. They would have said three in the afternoon on a spring day. <laughs> yeah, right, you're right. You're right. Mm. Um, okay, which means that a new analysis finds that global farmland use Damn. could become 37 to 48% globally with the adoption of optimal farming practices. It's like practices. all the farms in China, right? Science. But yeah, so global is the key Yeah, because this is because of the massively inefficient farming that's happening in many places in yeah. the world. So they said that uh, like North America and Europe pretty much already optimal. Like, there's n- almost no gains yeah. Yeah. to be had. If you said United there. States, I would have said, thanks, shit. No way. Yeah. yeah. But Sub-Saharan Africa, there, there's a lot of improvement. And so if all farming were done at the current technological optimum, you know, that's where you get the 37 to 48% reduction in land use. And even even with that, we would have like a 2.6% increase in food productivity. F- food prices would come way down there would be uh, more distribution of food. So it could have a lot of benefits if we could you know, re- do that. And we could imagine if we get to that, you know, that 40, 48% level, all of that land could be turned back over into natural ecosystems, which would be a huge benefit to the yeah. environment or in could be, many ways. It could be raped and pillaged too. Right. And, you know, the probability of that happening, very low. So they said they, so the, their analysis... Uh, the assumption of the of their analysis based upon you know it wasn't just they didn't just pull a figure out of their butt but they they figured that the difference between the least efficient and most efficient farming was about eighty percent. Right? Wow! If a certain number of the farms out there could be four times more productive, then globally it averages out to about almost you know twice as productive for for uh, the land being used. Mm. And of course, we should not go in the opposite direction. Mm. By in, by embracing less productive, you know, farming practices, uh, organic, uh, which would, <clears throat> in, yeah, which would increase our need for land. You know, land use is the biggest negative impact that farming has on the environment. So minimizing our land use is critical. That's also why I think that we need to maximize hydroponic farming. Not everything can be farmed hydroponically, but for those things that can be, it's amazingly land and water efficient. And of course, and you could, we talked about this, you could do it, you could have a, a hydroponic farm in the middle of a city, you know, yeah. basically in a skyscraper. So right next to where the food's going to be used, which then also it has its efficiencies of its own. Lots of room for improvement. That's, that's the good news. If you want to look at it in a positive way, lots of room for improvement. All right. Well, Bob and Jay, good job. Thanks, man. Mm. It still could have uh, hit at three in the F. Could have. Could. could or three. Have, yeah. three if yeah, they yeah. find it out there's someday... There's just, there isn't a news item that says that, that's all. Well. <laughs> all right, Evan, give us a quote. This quote was offered up by a listener, Paul Donkersloot from Perth. That's in Australia. I love that name. Donkersloot? Don- Paul Donkersloot. Thank you, Paul. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. Charles Darwin. Yeah, that cuts the other way too. That where they, people who know very little who think that science has already solved problems that it hasn't. Mm-hmm. You know, pseudoscience, basically. And uh, on science-based medicine, we call this the arrogance of ignorance. 
Yeah. Because there's two things tend to go hand in hand. The people who know the least seem to be pre- supremely confident that they know the most. This is obviously a Dunning-Kruger type of right. phenomenon. Yeah. Charles Darwin observed that, what, 150 years ago? Uh, yeah, that was 1868 is when he wrote yeah. that. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for joining me this week. Sure, thank you, man. Steve. We'll see you guys on the Friday live stream. Live Friday. Sarah will be, will be joining us next week. She'll be back, her usual schedule. But until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 